Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's Center for Middle East Studies colloquium. It's my great pleasure today to introduce to you our speaker, Alex Winder. My name is Nadia Ali. I'm the director of the Center for Middle East Studies here at Brown. Um, so Alex who is going to speak for about um, 30 minutes and then we'll have time for Q&A. Alex Winder, he is a visiting assistant professor and director of undergraduate studies um, at the Center for Middle East Studies here at Brown. He is executive editor of the Jerusalem Quarterly and edited and introduced between Jaffa and Mount Hebron the diaries of Muhammad Abdul Hadi al-Sharuf, 1943 to 1962, published in Arabic by the Institute for Palestine Studies. Alex has also contributed to a number of different journals, including al Muntaka, Biography, Journal of Palestine Studies, and Radical History Review, as well as online resources, including Hazin, Palestinian Journeys, and Tahrir Documents. Today, Alex is giving a talk entitled Investigating Indigeneity, Custom, Colonialism, and Crime in Mandate, Palestine. Alex, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Nadia. And I do want to begin by thanking uh, Brown Center for Middle East uh, Studies, uh, particularly Nadia and Barbara for hosting the colloquium and taking care of logistics. Um, and of course, all of you for joining, friends, comrades, colleagues, teachers, students. I know nobody wakes up these days thinking, I wonder how I can spend more time on Zoom. Um, so I really appreciate you all being here. And um, before I begin a talk whose title and subject matter evokes indigeneity, I also want to acknowledge the indigenous communities, uh, the Narragansett and Wampanoag peoples uh, on whose land Brown University and the city of Providence, Rhode Island sit and to encourage all of us to consider the indigenous communities who live and continue to, who lived and continue to live um, where we do. So I'll begin now. Uh, in September, 1944, Fayez Nazal, a Jerusalem-based lawyer, wrote Palestine's high commissioner on behalf of the elders of Beit Umar, a village north of Hebron, to appeal a collective fine levied on the village. The fine was prompted by a series of incidents over more than a year, mostly involving the destruction of tomato plants. Nazal addressed each incident in turn. In August, 1943, tomato plants belonging to the family of a man named Isa were destroyed. According to Nazal, Isa and his family accused a man named Murshid, quote, with whom they have finally agreed as to settlement according to the law of Arab custom, end quote. The following month, a man named Muhammad and his five brothers, believing that one of their three half brothers had been involved in the death of Muhammad's wife, retaliated by uprooting their half-brother's tomato plant. Eventually, compensation was paid for the plant and for Muhammad's wife, and the feud was brought to a close. In another incident, one villager accused four brothers of uprooting his tomatoes, there being, Nizal wrote, quote, enmity between the two families. But, Nizal confirmed, quote, both parties have finally agreed upon the settlement of this dispute in accordance with custom, end quote. Finally, a woman named Amira had disappeared in March. According to Nizal, Amira, quote, at one time eloped with a lover of hers and was brought back. She was chained in the house of her father until she disappeared, end quote. British officials presumed she had been murdered, but lacking evidence had brought no charges. Nizal argued that a collective fine brought under the collective punishments ordinance was inappropriate as the perpetrators were in each case known and quote, in any event, the complainants involved in the cases referred to above have in their own way discovered the offenders and have arranged with them as to settling these private disputes in accordance with the law of local custom, which reigns in the Hebron subdistrict, end quote. Beit Omar, it seems, preferred its own justice to that of the British Mandate Administration, which governed Palestine after World War I. While the acting district commissioner of the Hebron subdistrict, Robert Newton, claimed that collective punishment was warranted due to the village's quote-unquote lawlessness, Nizal described a community engaged in acts of violence, but also reconciliation in adherence with the law of custom. Today, and at greater length in my book project, I aim to unpack these contrasting visions of rule of law 
and suggest a reading of the law of custom in the framework of indigenous justice. I do so by showing how advocates and officials, the Nazals and Newtons of the world, as well as scholars and journalists in Mandate Palestine, use custom to make claims about Palestinian society and Britain's administration. I also examine criminal investigations to see how primarily rural Palestinian communities engaged in juridical practices that predated, coincided with, conflicted with, and overlapped with colonial systems. I give particular attention to the kinds of cases seen in Beit Omar, so-called honor crimes, blood feuds, and rural property crime, including crop destruction and animal theft, which the British termed agrarian crime these being the acts most closely associated with customary justice in Mandate Palestine. I'll begin, however, by briefly discussing application of the framework of indigeneity to Palestine. The past decade or so has seen a resurgence of work on Palestine and Israel that employs a settler colonial framework that sees Zionism's manifestation in the space of Palestine, Israel as an ongoing settler colonial project that seeks to expand its territorial base for settlement by displacing and ultimately eliminating the indigenous population of Palestinians. There's much to say about this framing and limited time. Um, if there are questions, I'm happy to address those in the Q&A. And I do point all of you who are interested to Leila Abu Zuhra's recent piece in Critical Inquiry, which does a really nice job, I think, of, of describing this revival of the settler colonial framework with regard to Palestine. But this framework has also sparked further questions including whether the settler colonial framework itself continues to privilege the settler as historical agent, and what frameworks might allow us to examine Palestinian society as something more than kind of reacting to or victims of settler colonialism. And these are lines of inquiry, in my mind, in keeping with longer standing efforts by the likes of Ibrahim Abu Luhud and Bashar Dumani, among others, and recently, Rana Barakat has drawn on scholarship in Native American and Indigenous Studies by the likes of Jody Bird, Robert Warrior, Kehalani Kawanui, and Stephen Salida to advocate for what she calls writing slash writing. It works better if you're looking at it. So W-R-I-T writing slash R-I-G-H-T writing Palestine Studies as a project of Indigenous intellectual sovereignty, one that would not only center Palestinians as historical agents, but embed them within the world that they themselves make in which they understand and experience in ways that exceed a colonial or settler colonial frame. So it's in this stream that I'm dipping my toes to think about indigenous justice in Mandate Palestine, asking what forms of justice might we understand as indigenous and why, and what work does indigeneity do analytically and politically? And of course, there are kind of multiple ways of conceiving of indigenous justice in Palestine. Um, is it justice for indigenous people in Palestine? Is it any justice practiced by indigenous people in Palestine? But to my mind, the kind of most generative uh, definition and the one that I'll use here um, is, is those forms of justice that emerge from the indigenous population of Palestine and therefore reflect or embody its worldviews and priorities. And in particular, one finds in Mandate Palestine a system of adjudication, arbitration, and reconciliation that was widespread among Palestinians living outside of urban centers in which operated in lieu of, in parallel to, and at times in conjunction with state institutions. And there are various terms that describe different aspects of the system. So orf or Qanun uh, Orfi, uh, translated as customary law, Qanun um, Asha'ari or Kabali to um, describe tribal law or tribal adjudication, and Sulh or Islah, which is reconciliation or peacemaking. And despite certain distinctions uh, between them, these terms tend to be used expansively or, or interchangeably um, by both practitioners and observers. So I think it's useful um, for me to, to take them together um, and think about how they formed a system of communal justice that viewed injury as socially embedded and in the event of disputes or violations laid out pathways to restore social order through the intervention of arbitrators or mediators, if necessary. And the social standing of these arbitrators and mediators, who generally uh, were well-regarded and, and seen as um, um, honorable or, or kind of notable figures, uh, put pressure on parties to enter into negotiations and agree to resolutions that would satisfy both disputants and the community as a whole. Uh, they drew on communal norms and established formulae 
Uh, and by doing so, arbitrators and mediators induced those who had caused injury to ask forgiveness and offer restitution, and those who had been injured to accept. And this was often a delicate balancing act, right? As offering or accepting forgiveness or restitution could, if the conditions were not right, be seen as an act of humiliation um, that diminished the honor of the social unit, whether family, clan, tribe, or what have you. As the Palestinian nationalist activist, journalist, and lawyer, Omar Saleh al-Barghusi wrote in his 1922 article, Judicial Courts Among the Bedouin of Palestine, quote, judges have ample jurisdiction and are not bound to govern their decision by any written code, which fixes the maximum or minimum penalty. Their most important duty is to know the rank of different families. A murder, violation of female honor, or of the right of a noble and powerful family weigh more heavily than a murder, rape, etc., of other families. A hamula, family, in which many females have been violated or many members killed, is despised and regarded as weak and dishonorable, being therefore placed on a lower level than other families. The judges have full authority to increase or reduce a penalty, always taking into consideration the common welfare and the personal influence of both parties." End quote. This pairing of common welfare and personal influence illuminates what anthropologist Sharon Lang calls a hierarchy egalitarian tension within Palestinian communal justice. So while the rhetoric and ritual of these processes uh, stress the restoration of a balance of honor among all parties, so this idea that society is best served when all are accorded equal honor. The power to resolve disputes and the substance of resolutions rely on social hierarchy. That is, society is best served by those of exceptional honor. Now, Barhusi's article is one of several notable Mandate Era works on communal justice in Palestine. Alongside Elias Haddad's Blood Revenge Among the Arabs, published like Barhusi's piece in the Journal of the Palestine Oriental Society, and Araf al Araf's monograph, Al Qada Bain al Bedu, so Justice Among the Bedouin. Notably, all of these focus on Bedouin, though Barhusi acknowledges that these judicial principles also guide legal procedure among the peasants of Palestine. And Haddad admits in his article that most of the material comes from the mayor of Beit Jala, a Christian town of over 3,000 residents at that time. And manifold references to communal justice in the Mandate Arab press, police and court records, and petitions offer further confirmation that this system was used by Christians and Muslims alike, hailing from towns and villages, settled tribal communities, and mobile ones. But this emphasis on, on Bedouin isn't coincidental, I think. In casting Bedouin as repositories of Arab tradition, these works and others show the influence of Arab Nahda and European Orientalist thinking. And we can see a, a kind of a colonial expression of this thinking, for example, in the opening sentence of the 1925 book, Bedouin, Just, Bedouin Justice, written by Austin Kennett, a former British administrative officer in Egypt's Western desert and the Sinai. Quote, the word Bedou, plural Bedouin, is derived from an old classical Arabic word, meaning original. Hence the basic meaning of the term is original or aboriginal, end quote. So contemporary Bedouin justice thus became a kind of looking glass onto the remote past. And Kenneth's use of the term aboriginal also reminds us of the way uh, that indigeneity is linked to temporality, implying priorness, but also especially in discourses of settler triumph, pastness. There are resonances here with present day attributions of indigeneity to Palestine's Bedouin, uh, contributing to what Lana Tatur refers to quite critically and I think appropriately as the culturalization of indigeneity that is turning it into a kind of cultural preservation work um, rather than a political project uh, of decolonization. So with this in mind, I'm, I'm sensitive to the potential pitfalls of drawing a kind of one-to-one -one equation between Bedouin practices and indigenous justice, even if, as I mentioned before, these practices were and are used by non-Bedouin. Still, I think there's value to, to thinking of this system um, as a form of indigenous justice. In 1979, the journal Sha'un Filistinia, published by the PLO's Palestine Research Center, translated Barghouti's article on tribal courts into Arabic and republished it with an introdu introduction by the Palestinian intellectual Elias Sunbar. Sunbar writes that the importance of Barghouti's text is that it allows, quote, study of the traditional structure of Palestinian society. For unlike the state courts, 
in which the concept of justice manifested is the relationship between the individual and the central authority. These institutions represent a foundational body of knowledge as a form of indigenous emanation, from the structures of the tribes themselves, end quote. Sunbar explicitly contrasts tribal justice with state courts. And whereas the latter's decisions carry weight because of the coercive authority of the state, Barhuthi's text reveals, quote, implicitly that the decisions of the tribal judge emanate from a perception of limited and voluntary acceptance among the members of the group or tribe, end quote. So this is different from the significance of tribal justice put forward by Orientalists. So that is Bedouin law is not indigenous because the Bedouin maintained this kind of untouched by time Aboriginal Palestinian past, but because it emerged from a Palestinian collective and was rooted in and responsive to its worldviews and priorities. This distinction is significant in part because it allows indigenous justice to be dynamic, to shift and adapt rather than remain frozen in an imagined past. Although some recent scholarly work on Sulh as a form of indigenous justice does just that. It also means that an examination of indigenous justice at work can illuminate the socio-political dynamics that gave it authority. That is, we can kind of historicize it and, and use it as a way of understanding some of the dynamics of the society from which it emerges. This is in stark contrast to the way custom was mobilized by British colonial officials. So let's take, for example, the question of so-called honor crimes, including but not limited to femicide. Adia Hassisi and Deborah Bernstein have co-authored some of the, the best work on so-called honor killings in Mandate Palestine, uh, using court records to understand legal strategies and patterns of adjudication. And they write that family honor emerged in British criminal legal thought as, quote, a binding social requirement, reinforced by custom, tradition, and at times religion, thus creating a uniform understanding of communal codes of honor, end quote. Thus, for example, in a 1925 case of a man accused of killing his aunt who became pregnant out of wedlock, a senior British judge stated, quote, the feeling in the village that the male members of the family of a woman of loose character must vindicate the family honor was often so prevalent that the man had the choice only between murder or leaving the village, end quote. So this was the prevailing British view of custom. It was kind of locked in place. It imposed upon Palestinians an obligation to act in a particular way. And therefore, if a case was determined to be one of family honor, this precluded further investigation and reduced the matter largely to one of sentencing. And the, really the question of whether custom should be a mitigating factor in British sentencing. Let's take, for example, the 1940 trial of a man, Ali, for the murder of his cousin, Hameda, in a remote area outside of Hebron. Bernard Shaw, a British judge on the case, and not that Bernard Shaw, uh, described it as, quote, a typical case of murder for family honor. That is, he slotted it into this kind of framework that I just described. But the details are not so simple. Hameda had married Ali's brother in 1931 or 1932, but the marriage was not happy. And after about six months, Hameda returned to live with her mother and Ali's brother eventually took another wife. Eight years later, Hameda became involved with another man raising certain questions. So among these questions, had Hameda divorced uh, her first husband? So Ali, Ali's brother and Hameda's mother said no, and Hameda's sister said yes. Had she actually married this second man? Ali asserted she had, Hameda's mother wasn't sure, and her sister thought that she had. Had Ali and his brother's family made peace with the family of Hameda's new man? Hameda's mother said so, though she wasn't at the peacemaking. These were largely male affairs, if not exclusively so. Uh, and she wasn't sure if it took place before or after Hameda had remarried. And Hameda's sister wasn't uh, sure if peace had been made at all. To further complicate matters, Hameda's mother and sister, and three women who had been gathering firewood with Hameda when she was killed, testified that Ali had, after killing her, removed a headdress of coins, which Ahmeda's mother had given to her when she married Ali's brother. All of the women witnesses at the trial returned to this matter of the headdress, but the judges paid it no attention, presumably seeing it as a distraction from the true motive of family honor. So here we see a window into the distinction between indigenous justice and colonial interpretations of custom. 
for the judges, two Britons and a Sorbonne educated Zionist immigrant to Palestine, custom could be reduced to whether Ahmed's murder was or was not motivated by honor. Indigenous justice, by contrast, demands that the complex dynamics leading up to the murder be taken into account and refuses to ignore the matter of the headdress, whose theft called into question Ali's honor and prompted questions of restitution, neither of which factored into the court's blinkered view of the case. Ultimately, the judges sentenced Ali to death, but his lawyer, George Salah, appealed the decision, supported by a certificate relating to custom and tradition, assurances that clemency, quote, will meet a general satisfaction and appreciation in Hebron district, and a letter from Mr. Galil says, the Sheikh of Sheikhs of the Beni Sakhar Federation in Jordan, a major kind of tribal confederation. The High Commissioner, Harold McMichael, in response to this petition, reduced the sentence in keeping with established precedent. Indeed, from the very first uh, prime, uh, High Commissioner of Palestine, Sir Herbert Samuel, um, we see this kind of treatment of, of uh, honor crimes and the reduction of penalties upon um, uh, appeal. And in 1925, uh, Samuel argued that, quote, such customs as blood feuds and murders in defense of family honor may have been in the past essential to a certain extent to the preservation of life and morality amongst the pr primitive communities. And it was on that account that he hesitated to refuse to consider them as extenuating circumstances in certain cases which arose in Palestine, end quote. And I want us to kind of note the shifting temporality in the statement, right? Acknowledging the necessity of custom in the past, um, but using it to justify colonial policy in the present. Um, so again, kind of relegating, seeking to relegate indigeneity um, to a, a past era. And while custom could be used to justify clemency for men who had killed their female relatives, the same argument was also made for the imposition, imposition of collective punishment, which British officials claimed was rooted in the same principles of shared injury and responsibility, responsibility upon which communal justice rests. And so I'd like to raise one last example of a feud that, like in the case of uh, Beit Omar, with which I opened, uh, illuminate, illuminates the dissonance between collective punishment and communal justice, and also shows the necessity of an interpretation of an indigenous justice in Mandate Palestine as dynamic, that is following the lead of those that used it to address the tensions and contestations that emerged out of really intense socio-political changes in the Mandate period. So in May, 1946, a clash in the Northern Jordan Valley village of al Obedia pitted two groups against each other. In one camp was the village head, uh, or Mukhtar, and his supporters who wished to sell village lands to a Zionist land purchase agent working for the Palestine Jewish Colonization Association. Ranged against him were a group who opposed the sale and who expressed their refusal to cooperate in a meeting at the Mukhtar's house, prompting a series of confrontations uh, between the two group, groups after this meeting. On May 21st, the Mukhtar's faction attacked a group of these opponents uh, and killed one of them. Two men were accused in the deadly attack and sought refuge in Tiberias while local notables arranged a, a temporary truce or atwa of 45 days as part of an effort to resolve the dispute permanently. These efforts didn't bear fruit, however, and two months later, the Mukhtar wrote to the police complaining that, quote, the agitators, that is his opponent, did not cease subjecting the members of our family to continuous assault. He continued, quote, this despite the fact that I and my clan own most of the village land and that these troublemakers do not have property and most of them are unemployed. For almost a week, many notables from surrounding villages have come to address the problem and they have refused and did not submit to the decision of the arbitrators intending in so doing to continue their troublemaking and attacks against us, end quote. Expressing concern that these attacks would continue, the Mukhtar asked the police to exile his opponents from the village for at least a year, if not permanently, or to appoint an auxiliary policeman to the village whose cost the village would bear. These were, it should be noted, common punishments enacted via the collective punishments ordinance upon quote unquote lawless villages like Beit Omar. By all indications, the Mukhtar's opponents were bucking custom by refusing reconciliation with a clan of higher status. But if we hold to a, to a definition of indigenous justice 
is that which emanates from the indigenous population embodying their worldviews and priorities, it becomes possible to see these quote unquote agitators refusal to reconcile as an act of indigenous justice. They had stood firm against opening village lands to Zionist colonization and had been attacked and even killed for their commitment. Prolonging the feud became a way of demanding justice, not denying it. So having given a rough account of the kinds of investigations that formed the basis of my book project, and I'd wanted to talk a little bit about this kind of category of agrarian crime as well, but given the time, I'll, uh, if you're interested, we can discuss that in the Q&A. Um, I wanna conclude with some general thoughts about my own investigation into indigeneity in Mandate Palestine. Because I use this word investigating in the title, not because or not only because it produces a nice alliteration and resonates with the subject matter, but because I see the question of indigeneity as more generative than its assumption. Indigenous justice is a useful concept only if it emerges as a living, breathing thing and not an ossified set of laws or norms. It is valuable if it helps us better understand complex dynamics of kinship, gender, social hierarchy, property, environment in Mandate Palestine, not if it produces a romanticized vision of, of social harmony. Now questions of land and the multi-vectored forms of collectivity in which modes of placemaking and occupancy are enmeshed, to quote Mark Rifkin, have unsurprisingly been at the forefront, forefront of articulations of and research on Palestinian indigeneity. But questions of law and justice are also significant, not only to arrive at a more complete and complex understanding of Palestinian society in the past, but also in looking to the future. And I think, again, it's, I, I wanna stress this kind of emphasis on temporality and not relegating indigeneity um, to a, a vanished past. So if the study of indigenous relationships to place can help challenge normative property regimes, then I think challenges to normative regimes of justice may similarly benefit from exploration of indigeneity. And I'll stop there and uh, thank you for your patience and look forward to any uh, questions you may have. Thank you very much, Alex. Um, thanks. Uh, so I would like to invite um, anyone to either put in the question in the chat, but I'm also happy to take um, just um, raised hands. Maybe I'll start, Alex, and um, this is not going to be surprising coming from me. I feel a bit boring kind of asking similar questions, but <laughs> it, it has, of course, a gender angle. So. Um, Clearly, gender is written all over. I see it between the lines. Um, and so I guess I have several questions. On a conceptual level, I have a question. So how is indigeneity intersecting with gender or how is it gendered? And I guess on an empirical level, um, so when you speak about the, the family ranking and, you know, the kind of significance of the family that that um, the social hierarchies in tension with this idea of the common welfare. Clearly the social hierarchies are not just class-based and sort of uh, prestige and reputation, but these are also gendered again. So if you could speak a little bit and reflect on that. Yeah, absolutely. And I think um, it also raises questions about the sources that I'm dealing with, right? Which um, you know, in many ways, kind of thinking about how to access um, things that are kind of buried or don't appear in um, official sources, and in particular, how, um, you know, the sources I'm using also often kind of erase women and women's voices and, and kind of women's um, perspectives. Uh, so I think, you know, it's, it's, Certainly kind of the, the, the dynamics within villages were very much kind of, um, and the hierarchies, the social hierarchies were very much gendered in which kind of, um, uh, and certainly kind of most of these, you know, these were rural societies for the most part, um, kind of villages, maybe towns, but certainly um, those who were kind of seen as the, in the position to adjudicate um, or kind of mediate conflicts were men and those who were seen as the kind of the disputants were men, right? So it, we, we don't see disputes between men and women or disputes between two women, women being um, um, kind of resolved. It's disputes between groups of men who stand in often 
you know, for women who are who are kind of participants in, in these, um, which makes it, um, you know, difficult, if not impossible to kind of then kind of think about what role women are playing in, in these um, kinds of disputes and, and their resolution, because just because they're not kind of there at the, you know, public facing element of it doesn't mean they're not involved. Um, but I think for me, what's, what's uh, and again, kind of, this is where the, the emphasis that I'm trying to make on the kind of the way indigeneity is not just a fixed thing, but kind of responds um, also kind of is working during the mandate period as we see kind of the women's social status changing. We see the um, kind of development of women's movements uh, in Palestine. We see um, kind of women's education uh, increasing to, to some degree. We see men kind of no longer working on their family land, but going to um, kind of work in big cities um, and producing certain kinds of um, kind of changing the, the, the social structure, the spaces, the, the kind of relationships that people have. And so I think, you know, in this, I, you know, I've, I've recently been kind of revisiting the work of uh, Lama Abu Alde on honor killings and thinking about how, you know, she writes, uh, I think, convincingly about how um, the kind of the nationalist compromise that, that shapes how honor killings are kind of produced in different ways in the nationalist period, right? So that there's a kind of changing um, expectations of gender, changing um, institutions that manage um, gender roles. Uh, and, and that this kind of, you know, it doesn't kind of undo, it, it kind of produces a different kind of patriarchal compromise and, and patriarchal, patriarchal ordering um, that produces different forms of violence against women. And so I think that's in terms of thinking about the mandate period, um, and the way kind of violence, gender violence is kind of st structured um, by institutions, by kind of social expectations, the, the kind of, these are changing and undergoing changes. And, and so what I'm hoping to try to do is, is to try to look at how these change over time. And certainly kind of the, the, the realm of state law plays a role in this because it becomes a kind of alternative venue, but also um, a way of kind of pushing, I mean, there's so many cases that are dismissed and, and not addressed because it's deemed a, a, a case of a family quarrel, right? And so that becomes a way of kind of pushing things back into the kind of realm of, of the family. So that's a, a kind of an incomplete answer, but that's kind of, I guess, how I'm trying to think about these issues. Great, thank you very much. So I have uh, Bishara, you raised your hand. Yes, thank you very much. Thanks, Alex, for a wonderful paper. Um, I'm wondering if the word justice is the right word to use in this context. How would you relate that word and our understanding of that word uh, to the question of salah or arf? Is justice really the issue here? And let's assume that it is. Uh, can one argue that notions of justice um, are not just not fixed, but they also have changed drastically um, beginning in the 1860s or so with all sorts of innovations of Ottoman governance on the village level. And of course, its interaction with British uh, norms and, and, and laws and, and practices on the ground after 1917. Uh, I really love the idea of having a history of um, local education of disputes for a variety of reasons and we need that history desperately and I think your work here is really important but I'm wondering if what you've discovered so far can help us understand number one is justice really the issue and number two how have notions of uh, what you might call indigenous forms of arbitration changed if at all uh, by the time you get into the late mandate period of the 1940s examples that you've used? Yeah, um, that's a good question. Is justice really what we're talking about here? Um, I think for me, it, it, I think it does a certain kind of work in that it, it's expansive and it, um, you know, it, 
like often this is talked about in terms of law. And so I think getting away from law and thinking about justice as a kind of um, a, a more capacious kind of framework, I think is useful for me. But I think that's, I mean, it's a, it's a question that speaks um, really to the heart of what I'm doing. So I think maybe I have to sit with that a bit longer. Um, as, as for the kinds of changes that, that you're speaking about, I think um, absolutely. I mean, there's, there's really kind of over this kind of, you know, century from the mid 19th century to mid to the mid 20th century, um, we're seeing um, really big changes in terms of kind of how how people derive social from what sources people derive social power um, and what kinds of um, methods there are for reproducing social power. And so I think those uh, those changes are kind of quite clearly going to kind of reconfigure how um, how these negotiations, how, how these mediations, who is in a position to mediate, um, uh, kind of who, who, what are the kinds of terms of, of mediation, thinking about, um, I mean, even thinking about, so, so the, the kind of question of agrarian crime, like ownership, property ownership um, is a huge question, right? And, and that there's kind of sh uh, changes that are taking place. Um, so if you're destroying, um, you know the olive trees that belong to someone, or or other kinds of um, you know fruit trees that belong to someone. It 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 matters whether that's happening kind of in the mid 19th century or the kind of mid uh, 20th century. Um, beyond that, so uh, and and um, certainly the kind of the rise of of nationalist politics uh, that we saw in in kind of the last case I looked at as well. I mean, I think what I'm also trying to do is is kind of nuance this narrative of kind of the old family structure is kind of replaced by a, a kind of modern structure of kind of professionalized elites and things like this. Um, and so I think one of the things that, that looking at these processes, these structures does is kind of open up new ways of, of, of thinking about who has social power and, and who doesn't and seeing the expression of that social power kind of manifested in the kinds of um, resolutions that, are, that, that Come to bear in, in disputes. Um, as for whether it's justice, yeah, I, I'll. I mean, luckily, I'll have opportunities to speak with you more about that. <laughs> um, uh, but I think that's yeah, longer conversation. But thank you for the question. Thank you. So, questions, comments? Yes, Emily. You're muted, Emily. Muted. Hello. Hi, Emily. Can you hear me? Okay. Video on for full transparency. Also, kitchen setting for realism. Um, mm. I just to chime into Bashar's question, I feel like you know a way to deal with this is just to to keep the Arabic terms um, in their place that are cropping up in the sources, and to sort of force. This is more of a comment. I'm just like building off his question, but to, to keep the Arabic terms in place and allow them to trouble the Western term or the English terms that we might apply in different circumstances and to say like, you know, maybe it is justice, maybe it isn't, maybe those, maybe the, the things that we think of as just or legal or, you know, these are all socially constructed at different historical periods and, and the changing words themselves, like if you were to track the words that used in different places, used among different communities, um, and how the British administration sort of translated them versus how they, the Ottoman administration, just to keep the language sort of mutable and force the Arabic and maybe even Ottoman terms to challenge the English terms could be a way to address this question of like, are we, what are we talking about? Are we talking about justice? Are we talking about law, et cetera? No, thank you. That's an excellent suggestion. And I mean, it's it's terminology has been something that um, I've struggled with in, in part because kind of there's this field right of, um, you know, of sort of like customary law. And I don't love that because custom, I think, has this this baggage, right, that I sort of talked about or informal justice. But on the other hand, there's many ways in which uh, this is like a they're very formal kind of elements to this, right? There's formula that are, are followed and, and kind of 
structures that are very tightly regimented, right, in terms of how one resolves a dispute, even if the like the the content of that dispute uh, is is quite different. Um, kind of extra legal justice also is difficult, right? Because so I, I, you know, the the suggestion to use the Arabic. I mean, one of the difficulties with the Arabic is that there is this kind of tendency to describe it in terms of tribal tribalism, which I think gives a, a you know, Hashari or Kabali, uh, which really gives a false impression as to what communities are engaging in these practices because it really extends much beyond um, you know, tribal communities in, in Palestine. And so that's been kind of one of the you know, difficult parts of, of retaining that kind of Arabic language, right? Because there's really, I mean, Ashari is, there's no real other way of kind of viewing that, even if it's being used in a way that, that kind of describes other populations. Um, but, but definitely it's something to think about. And, I, and I'll also look forward to maybe picking your brain more on this as I go further. Great, thank you, Emily. We now have Paul who has a question. Paul? I'm also in my kitchen. Um, maybe this is kind of just jumping off what you just said. I want to ask about maybe like sources of power and the question of like jurisdiction to maybe get at this a little more mm -hmm. um, of kind of like, you know, what, like where, I guess like where are the folks that are sort of exercising legal power and then you know, like what their jurisdiction, like the limits their jurisdictions are and how that changes. Um, like, and is, you know, I'm just, is this like a rural thing or is like, is there an urban sort of source as well? Because I mean, then that gets to the question of like, sort of like the perennial sort of what is community? And I'd be like to hear more about that. Yeah. Um, thanks, Paul. Um, and it's good to see everyone's kitchens also. Um, so this is actually a, a really good question. And, and so a lot of these, um, the authors, so um, like Haddad, like uh, Barhusi, like Araf al Araf, who are kind of writing in the, the early mandate period, they emphasize this, uh, kind of that this, that often kind of one's position as a judge is hereditary, right? So that, that this is something that's kind of passed down um, from father to son and, and kind of remains in a family line. But often kind of they'll qualify that by saying that this is, that's the case in uh, tribal communities, right? That, that this is kind of the, um, the norm there, but it's not necessarily the case in, in those communities that are not tribal, um, other rural communities. Um, as for whether it, it takes place outside of rural communities, I mean, it does. And I think there we see it, especially in kind of places like, like Hebron, for example, is, is seen as really a kind of bastion of this, um, this form of uh, adjudication or, or kind of dispute resolution. And there are kind of notable families from Hebron have kind of influence um, in the city, but also in the villages around it. Um, but we also, and, and so I also mentioned Miskal um, Sayyid, so the, the sheikh of sheikh of sheikhs of the um, uh, Bani Sakhar. So here's someone who's kind of based in, in Transjordan and, and Jordan and kind of, you know, of course the, the kind of boundaries of the tribal uh, confederation do go into Palestine, but he kind of involves himself in cases in Palestine as a way of, of kind of continuing and, and building up his authority um, to kind of serve as a mediator, to serve as a, an arbitrator in, in these cases. What you also see in, in the mandate period is kind of the, the, um, the way officials, state officials kind of take on this role, right? So I, I came to this really through studying policing in, in Palestine. And you see police officers who are kind of stationed in a particular place who become involved in, in kind of negotiating and um, mediating uh, disputes. And in part there, although some of them did come from notable families, right, their um, authority is derived by the fact that they, if the kind of um, mediation doesn't bring about a resolution, if the resolution doesn't hold, they're able to kind of come in with the power of the state to punish the different actors. And finally, and this is something uh, I've kind of published uh, uh, recently an article in the Radical History Review, during moments of, of upheaval, so in the 1936 to 39 revolt, we see a kind of the way in which the revolt also kind of transforms what kinds of figures 
are, are, are able to kind of have the authority and the kind of the social power to um, adjudicate uh, disputes or to, to mediate disputes. So we have, have people who are prominent figures in the revolt, but who kind of their social status before the revolt was, was kind of perhaps marginal. So people who were kind of working on the docks in Haifa or kind of selling cigarettes um, in Haifa, um, who because of their connection to um, Izzedin al-Qassam and their kind of their, their leadership within the revolt, their militancy within the revolt, become people who, who mediate disputes in the context of the revolt. So it's really a kind of very dynamic um, scene. And, and, and this question of um, you know, jurisdiction is, is a very fluid one um, during the mandate period and, and, kind of, and, and really kind of um, shows how the kind of the, the multiple different kind of economic, political, structural, um, ways in which kind of social power is also being reconfigured are then kind of being uh, played out in these arenas as well. Um, I hope that it doesn't really answer your question, but it, I think maybe speaks to some of the complexity, right? So, so kind of um, jurisdiction is always kind of a, a matter of negotiation, right? It's in essence like, and and this is something that 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 is important, is that you know basically mediators you know, kind of increase their authority to mediate through the act of mediation, right? It's an, almost a kind of, you know, like cyclical process, right? You, you gain the authority to mediate by showing yourself to be an effective mediator or arbitrator. Um, and, and so it, it's in a way kind of once you're able to enter that sphere, you can kind of, um, kind of advance if, if, if you have social power. Um, there was something I was gonna say about that, but maybe I'll move on to the next question if there is one. Okay, is there any other question, comments? First, thanks for the paper, Alex. Um, it's a fascinating topic and I think ties into the work of a lot of us here. Um, so customary law, which we usually put in quotes is a really vast topic, right? That cuts in, especially in the history of modern contemporary uh, comparative empires. So I'm wondering, while I was listening to your presentation, to what extent does your study on Mandate Palestine share or diverge from similar processes of what we can call codifying and quotes or fixing usually customary law and say, I think most famously British India uh, with the anglo mohammedan law or but also French Algeria and Dutch Indonesia, all these cases. So I was just wondering what you found distinctive or surprising particularly for people who are interested in these themes in other places. Yeah. Thanks. No, yeah, thank you, Faith. That's an excellent question. And, and yeah, a big topic, um, but a really rich one. Um, so I think one way in which kind of what I'm looking at is slightly different is that a lot of this happens in kind of civil law rather than criminal law. Um, uh, but it certainly does happen in, in, in criminal law as well. And I think, you know, for example, like the Austin Tenet text, the Bedouin justice that I uh, referenced in, in the talk, um, this in many ways is a kind of textbook that comes out of, I mean, he was a district administrator in British colonial Egypt, right? So, um, and, and what we see is there's a certain willingness by the British to put in place um, certain kinds of in, you know, structures. So they set up in Southern Palestine in the Nakab, um, Bedouin courts, right, which kind of uh, they kind of blend a, a kind of official, um, th they allow kind of the official government to to try to control um, these uh, kinds of, of spaces and the kind of um, to manage, right, tribal um, affairs in a certain way. Um, and this is kind of similar to what happens in, in other places, other colonial situations where you have the establishment of um, you know separate venues to manage kind of what are, what's seen as custom, um, which is, is certainly uh, the case in, in some of the other um, um, places you mentioned. I mean, I think one of the kind of some of the places that have been interesting for me to consider also are um, in, in Africa. So you know, a lot of also British um, policing kind of experience in Palestine came out of Kenya. Um, and, and there was a kind of sense in which, uh, you know, 
applying certain ideas, especially of, of Muslim custom, right? So this is kind of a way in which a kind of sense of, of a, a kind of universal Islamic um, custom emerges as well through these kinds of um, circuits of, of imperial um, kind of knowledge, but also personnel that are traveling from one place to another. So from Sri Lanka to Kenya to, to Palestine um, or from Egypt to Palestine. Um, so there is a lot of, of kind of sharing and, and kind of attempting to use the experience gained because in many ways, Palestine is like a very late colonial territory for Britain, right? It, it has many years of experience in, in India before that, um, as well as in, in Egypt. Um, I think it's, it's also, um, I mean, the, it, 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 the similarities I think are, are quite striking and, and what becomes also kind of notable is, is both the way that um, kind of there's overlaps between the kind of colonial, British colonial administration and certain elites in the colonized society that view, a, have a kind of modern project of modernization, right? So in the press in Palestine, they're, they're constantly kind of decrying the, the destruction of livestock, the feuding, the destruction of crops, right? In part because it's, um, it's seen as kind of irrational and, and unproductive. So I think there's, there's a kind of, that's also a parallel we see in other kinds of colonial settings. And the other thing is that, you know, in looking at, for example, in, in Latin America, um, that the, the structures and, and kind of ways in which kind of indigenous justice or indigenous kind of um, structures, you know, are destabilized. Um, so that there's this, this kind of way in which um, kind of violence increases as, as kind of these institutions are destabilized in, in some kinds of ways. Um, so that's, I mean, there's kind of a lot of different ways in which this, um, or kind of connections that, that I do, um, that I am interested in making and that I see, and, and certainly I think, you know, the British kind of, the imperial sphere within which this is happening is, is, is very clear in terms of, you know, if you, if you read the British um, kind of commentary about uh, these kinds of things, um, they're, they're constantly kind of looking elsewhere within the empire to kind of understand how custom operates and, and how it can be used to better govern, right? Because a lot of this is about maintaining a certain, I mean, there's a certain idea that the British have of, of what law should do, but they're also very interested in kind of governance. So this is why clemency takes place when you can say like, there's been a, a reconciliation between these families. This person was put in prison, you know, for, for killing this person from this other family. Um, it's, you know, it would be better to, to kind of keep the peace if you let him out of prison. So that's kind of, and the British logic there is, is about kind of making sure that they can govern this territory with the minimum amount of kind of financial, military, policing kind of um, resources. Uh, and that again is kind of, you know, this is what makes, I think, you know, colonial territories in one way kind of quite distinct from, from other territories, this shared idea of kind of the, the willingness to compromise certain kind of ideas in order to, to get the job of colonial governance done. I'd like to thank you, first of all, Alex, uh, for a very, very interesting paper. We're all very much looking forward to, of course, eventually reading the book. And I would like to uh, thank you for um, joining us. And um, yeah, thanks uh, to Barbara to uh, facilitate this meeting and um, hoping to see you soon. Bye-bye, everyone. Thank you, Nadia, and thank you to everyone.